I am going to turn this over to Janelle, who, thanks to Janelle, a friend of Josh, has been able to get him to get, uh, to come to QLI. Um, he's already a big fan of QLI, I can tell you that. Uh, he's spoken about our culture several times um, to several people. I know you've connected with Steve Kershke, and then I came and saw your guys' uh, organization, which is amazing. Um, and then I know we were talking about uh, getting you out here. And so Janelle is going to introduce uh, our speaker for today, our first external speaker for Huddle, where we get together, connect, learn, and celebrate. So I'll turn it over to you, Janelle. Thank you very much for being able to get uh, Josh to QLI. Awesome. Thanks, Nash. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. So with the current state um, of our nation and community, um, generations of injustice have become a topic of discussion among many platforms. Um, QLI has asked Josh Dotzler, who is the CEO of Abide and the teaching pastor at Bridge Church, just to come in and speak with us um, on the topic journey to justice. Um, I believe Josh can provide an insightful and outside perspective on a question that I've been asked personally by a lot of my white team, white team members of what can I do to be more helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Josh can offer some guidance on how we can move forward with this topic amongst our own leadership and our own culture. So thank you again, Josh, for coming in and speaking um, with us. But I'm sure some of our team members, but not many may know, um, about Abide and what Abide does for our North Omaha community. So I might have you kick it off with maybe explaining to us Abide and Abide's mission. Yeah, no, I'd love to to share that. And first of all, Janelle, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this this conversation. I love the huddle and just what you guys are doing, what you're talking about. I've had the opportunity to get to know Nash and uh, your CEO, Patricia and Steve on your team and so impressed with your guys' culture, with your team. Even in this season, I think it's, it's interesting. I think crisis is a revealer and it reveals what's on the inside of us. And as an organization, for you to really lean into this conversation, mm -hmm. to want to understand, to want to learn, to want to be better in this area, says so much about who you guys are as an organization. So it's honestly just an honor to be here. Love what you guys are a part of and what you're building. My, my history, my background, I'm born and raised right here in Omaha, not too far away. Grew up on 30th and Ames Street. And uh, my, my dad's a white guy from small town, Iowa. Any Iowegians in the house? Any, anybody from Iowa on the team? You know, there's always a couple couple Iowegians. We have, and, a, we have uh, a lot of those. Right? <laughs> you got a lot of them? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're got, they're all got, over even Omaha. Even John. John knows I see John like, yeah. with the thumbs up. We got Michaela. <laughs> we got Alicia. If you're from Iowa, it's like, yeah, I'm from Jen Iowa. Clark. <laughs> so my dad's from small town, Iowa. My mom's from uh, Washington, D.C. She's African-American, and uh, they met in college playing basketball. Basketball flows through our blood, uh, moved to Omaha. My dad was a chemical engineer. Our family lived in West Omaha, and he felt like he was called to something different and really wanted to pursue his calling, uh, had a good career, and so ended up quitting his job, moving our family to North Omaha, and that was 31 years ago, and when he moved our family into North Omaha, honestly, he didn't know what type of work he would do, didn't know what would, would end up uh, becoming our, our nonprofit, but started our organization Abide. And our, our mission is really to, we would when say- When was that, uh, Abide? Uh, 89, okay. 1989, okay. so 31 years okay. ago. That is, as soon as he got here was when he, uh, to Omaha was when he started Abide. Uh, he, nope, he had been a chemical engineer for, I don't know how many years, but for a handful of years, that's okay. actually what brought him to Omaha. Got it. And then as he was a chemical engineer, just felt like, man, there's something more for me. Nice. And uh, so quit his job. There was five of us kids at the time. And uh, today there's 14 of us. They run deep in the <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of dotzlers running, <laughs> running around. My dad always tells people his favorite scripture verse is be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> and I would say that he's lived that out. And so big family, moved to North Omaha, started our organization. And, and our mission is to revitalize the inner city one neighborhood at a time. We're really a community development organization. And over the years, honestly, the first 20 years was really just a lot of learning, being present in the, the community. Even a lot of my, my experiences when it comes to race, being mixed, my dad being a, a white guy moving into North Omaha and becoming a minority mm -hmm. really opened up his eyes to yeah. a lot of things that he never saw or understood before. And so started our organization 31 years later, it's been 
just amazing to see some of the change that's happened in some of the neighborhoods that we serve. And uh, we know we have a long way to go, but. Josh, was there something compelling for your dad? I think for, from a QLI perspective, we had uh, from our own compelling reason of what, what brought us here was families who had their children, right? And um, the only place that they had to go was nursing homes. Yeah. Um, their families were taking care of them and they wanted a place, you know, that could take care of their loved ones as yep. well as they could, you know? So what was the compelling thing that uh, drove at least your dad from that aspect, uh, besides being a minority moving into uh, North Omaha? What was yeah. the compelling reason? All about yeah, I mean, we, we talk a lot about calling and how we believe that we all have, ha have been wired and have unique passions and gifts and strengths for something very specific. And so for him, he was working his job nine to five, but he felt like there was something more. And specifically, we were a part of a church in our city, a large mm -hmm. church, great church. And, and, and what his heart was, was to see the potential within that church impact the community in a powerful Got way. It. Got it. And so he wrote a book uh, several years ago called Out of the Seats Into the Streets. And mm -hmm. with the, the heart and belief that everything that happened and everything that was inside the walls of that church, man, if that was felt on the outside in our community, things would be different. And so our whole, I would say, passion is to mobilize influence to revitalize the inner city. And that's, that's what gets us excited. That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, you want to share a little bit about those lighthouses? Because that's an important thing that I think that I, I, I learned from you when it comes to being proximal to certain yeah. things. And um, you want to share a little bit about the lighthouses? Uh, yeah. I mean, when I was young, our, our family, again, part of it was by accident. But we moved into a neighborhood that the police redlined is one of the most violent neighborhoods in our city. Yeah. And this was a neighborhood. I mean, our, our neighbor girls who were my sister's best friends were murdered house was shot at helicopters I mean overhead on a consistent basis I remember coming home one night and the neighborhood was was lined with police and they said they were looking for somebody on the loose they had to go inside check out our house to make sure the people they were looking for weren't in our house and so I grew up in this environment and um, my dad had helped start several nonprofits. we were doing a lot of work but realized that our strategy had to change because our neighborhood wasn't changing and so we started to just mobilize volunteers to our neighborhood. We bought a couple of abandoned houses, fixed them up. And as our family lived there, this neighborhood that was once redlined by the police is one of the worst. Two years later, the, the police came back and said this neighborhood that was once one of the worst is now one of the best. Wow. And so we just started to recognize the power of presence. And when, when people show up, their presence matters. And yeah. in communities like North Omaha, the saying is work hard, get an education, and you too can move out of the ghetto. And so we started to uh, strategize around this idea. We, my parents were living there. Our family was living there for 20 years before we started our lighthouse strategy. Oh, okay. But really, we were living it before you it ever became. It was, it, yeah, yeah, it was happening before yeah. we ever termed the language lighthouse. And so our, our vision is to see a lighthouse presence in every single neighborhood across the North Omaha community. And, you know, over the course of really the last 12 years, We've seen over 100 families decide to either stay and live in North Omaha or relocate their families to North Omaha to be a part of that lighthouse presence. Say that again when you said when you talked a little bit about uh, the saying of you can make it to by getting out yeah. of the ghetto. Say, say, yeah, yeah the, the saying in communities like North Omaha is work hard, get an education, and you too can move out of the ghetto. Get out of there. So success in life means to leave and go to somewhere that's nicer. Our vision is that people wouldn't leave, but they would decide to live and stay. And, and my wife and I probably represent just a community of people where I went to Creighton, graduated. She graduated from UNO. You get your college degrees, you get a good job. And then what do you do, man? You get look out. for a house in a nice neighborhood. And because we felt called to stay back, you know, my wife's family, they're like, why would you, why would you stay and live in this community? It doesn't make sense. But specifically for us, because we felt like we were called to be a part of the solution. So People are making that decision. They're sacrificing a lot, but because they want to be a part of something that's right. bringing change. And this is not talk. You know, I've been by your campus. It's, yeah. it's a vast campus and you guys are working on transforming, you know, uh, that whole campus and making it something that is, I know you, uh, you said it a few times, you know, as you're walking through, you know, these, this is old buildings at QLI. Yeah. You're talking about 30 years old, 30 year old buildings. And, you know, we're trying to get something that will make it, 
you know, uh, uh, so great, you know, and, and, and aesthetically pleasing. Yes. And, you know, but you guys are doing an amazing job. I met uh, one of your facilities uh, team members the yeah. day that I was out there. And um, there's a commitment. You can tell that there's a commitment and the feeling of a calling towards what you guys are doing. Well, I, I'll just say this. It's inspiring because I still remember coming on my tour of QLI right here with you and Steve and running into and meeting some of your facilities yeah. and, and your leadership and the culture, the spirit, the beauty, the peace coming on this campus man, you're, you can't help but be impacted when you're here. And so for us, it starts in the neighborhoods. We try to move people to the campus to really engage them. And then we're trying to raise up leaders and individuals and families who want to stay and be a part of the solution. So That's thanks amazing. for modeling it for us. That's amazing. No, thank you. Uh, I think I'm, I'm humbled and honored. Actually, today is, is my 20 year anniversary. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah I, 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 uh, you're too young to be <laughs> here for 20 years. I was like, man, uh, it feels like yesterday when I got my my my, my interview and, you know, wow. got, got started over here. I remember it just like it was yesterday. It's, wow. it's amazing. But uh, and I know that's what you guys have also looked at doing. I know you've had some people come through and um, you're trying to create an environment that also is about longevity and not yes. just getting out and going. So, yes. Um, and I know Abide is going to be one of our and has already been one of our partners when it comes to how we can transform the area that we, we we're in. I know we've done some work with teammates. Yeah. Patricia has got a lot of a uh, big vision when it comes to making sure that we're not just present yep. and fenced up in this area, but really how do we transform, um, attract people and make QLI look like Omaha, yes. you know, and be a yes. diverse. Um, so talking about a little bit about diversity, you know, um, how, how have you been able to um, work that when it comes to abide and some of the things that you have when it comes to your mission? Yeah. I mean, number one, it's, it's not easy. Um, and I think it's something that we're always, for us, it's, it's one of our values is better together. And a huge part of that value is diversity. And part of it as for me, my parents, you know, the mixed uh, biracial couple, uh, uh, diversity was something that we knew we had to be intentional about from the beginning if we were going to see it happen. And so my, uh, my, my mom, like we call her the diversity officer because she has such an eye for it. And part of my parents' experience was my dad, again, being from small town Iowa, mm -hmm. population 300, all white while they were married, they would go to restaurants and my mom would look around and she'd say, Ron, there's only five black people in this restaurant. And my dad would be like, who, who, why are you counting? Who's counting? And they would go into a grocery store and my mom would look over at my dad and say, Ron, they're, they're watching me. They're looking at me. And my dad would say, who's watching you? Who's looking at you? And while they were married, I, I love their story because they loved each other. They were married to each other. But my mom would tell my dad, your prejudice. And my dad would never say this because he probably knew the consequences, but I guarantee he was thinking this. No, I'm not prejudiced. I'm married to you. And, and so they would go back and forth. And it wasn't until my dad tells this story where they had my, my oldest sister and she's sitting in the middle of the car. And my dad looks down at my, my youngest or my oldest sister and says, man, she's so beautiful. She's going to grow up one day and she's going to marry some amazing white guy. And my mom looks back. She said, now my daughter, she's going to grow up. She's going to marry an amazing black guy. And so they go back and forth. And then my mom looks at my dad and says, see, I told you you were prejudiced. Then they asked this question. My mom asked my dad, said, Ron, if you had two candidates who were both qualified for a job, one was black and one was white, who would you hire? My dad said, I'd hire the white guy. My mom said, no, I wouldn't. I'd hire the black guy. And so what they realized is that they both, you know, using the word prejudice or racist is such a strong, mm -hmm. it's such so strong language. language. Yep. But what they realized is because of their worldview and their experiences, my dad had preferences because of the way he grew up, because of what he was familiar with, because yep. of what he was comfortable with. He had preferences and those preferences lead to prejudice. Mm -hmm. And so we all have bias. We all have prejudice based on the preferences that we have. And so I think when we think organizationally, We've just recognized that it takes people who see life in different ways to help us see things that we otherwise wouldn't see on our own. And so trying to be intentional about engaging a diversity of voices and, and perspectives always in the conversation to help us yeah. think through. No, I think that's an important thing when it comes to whether it's preferences based on what you grew up around or, you know, what you like or whatever it is. You know, yes. I think it, it, one of the values that we have at QLI is collaboration. You yes. know, and being collaborative, you cannot truly be collaborative unless you break down some of those barriers and actually get to know another person. So how yes. have you been encouraging people to break those barriers down? 
um, and actually build those relationships and get to know the other person. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's, there's probably at least two sides. Number one is understanding our personal bias. And until we recognize that we have a personal bias, we'll never recognize that there's other perspectives out there that we're not familiar with. And so once we get to a place where we can recognize it, then we can actually be a part of understanding the systemic racism and systemic challenges that are in our world and in our culture. You know, I think one of the things that I've been talking about a lot lately is, is just even redlining. Yeah. The idea of redlining is segmenting a population. Blacks were put into certain spheres and zones. Literally red lines were placed around those groups of people. They couldn't get access to certain resources mm -hmm. when it comes to housing funding funding. Yeah. As a result, generations later, you look at our city, still redlined man. it's it's Many still the the laws have changed but where do the black people live and where do the white people live you've got two completely different groups of people living in two different parts and and where's the prosperity versus where's the poverty yeah and so many people think that happened by accident no but you can look back and see how certain decisions that were made and and, and decisions and systems systems aren't bad it's like cultures yeah there's there's healthy cultures unhealthy cultures cultures are built one person at a time and so what happens is systems are, are, are built and put in place and then people start to follow them, not knowing that they've been a part of a system that's actually creating more division. Yeah. And so in, in our city, I mean, just the other day, our family, we were taking a walk downtown and we were downtown and this was before some of the protests happened. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at the new mall that was getting ready to get built. And we see a architectural rendering of this new beautiful mall with faces and pictures and people. And, and I'm looking at this, this picture and I don't see anybody that looks like me. Uh -huh. I don't see anybody of diversity. Uh -huh. and, and, and I'm half black, half white. My wife's half Mexican, half Thai. Our kids are mutts, beautiful mutts. <laughs> but like they're these diverse kids. And, and this is a vision and a picture of what success looks like in this part of our city. And we can't see ourselves in it. And so as a result, you can be white in our city. You can be successful and never interact with a black person. Yeah. You can't be black and pursue success without interacting with the dominant culture, the white culture. And so again, as a result, these systems wow. segregate and segment people. And if we're not careful, we'll just follow the cultural norms and trends that have been entrenched. Be before that have us. been entrenched and, and good hearted. This, this is what this has done good-hearted people that love me that love you that that say man i i, I want to be a part of the solution just don't understand the systems that we're building into on a consistent basis yeah well, i've heard someone say you know my biases are rational what yeah you, what's your take on that uh that their biases are rational are it's, rational yeah you'd have to unpack that. My natural response is I bet they are <laughs> rational to you <laughs> because that's what a bias is. It's what's rational to us. It's what we think is okay. It's what based on our experience. And until you start to understand the experience of somebody else, I mean, it's, it's the power of proximity. I think about my own story. I grew up in North Omaha watching the work my parents did. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you, Nash, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to leave. <laughs> ready, ready to get out. I said, man, I love what my parents are doing, but the crime, the violence, the chaos, specifically in the black community, caused me to want to leave. When I went and played basketball at college or in high school, guess who were the people creating the most problems on the team? Of course, yeah. Black people. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so I had even experiences, Here man. I'm out of here. The like two things I didn't want to do was be a pastor and live in North Omaha and, and the two things I ended up doing. <laughs> but, but what happened was people think, Oh, Josh, you lived in North Omaha. You grew up, you had compassion. You, you had a heart for the community. I wanted to leave. No, it that. wasn't until my wife and I moved back and we tell people, honestly, we, we didn't even necessarily want to move back, but we felt like that's what we were supposed to do. We felt like we were being obedient to our calling. But while we were living there, We've got kids living across the street, two, three, and four-year-olds roaming the streets by themselves. You've got eight-year-old girls who are raising themselves, coming over to, to, to our house. And my wife's like, hey, what are you having for dinner? And they're like, uh, I don't know, mm. maybe, maybe cheese and bologna. Mm. Nobody's telling them to, 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 to go to bed. Nobody's telling them to do their homework. I'm, 
my parents are taking me to practice and taking me to school events and I'm getting help and encouragement and love and support. You support you and you've got all these kids that are raising themselves. And then kids we're hanging out with on, on, on Sunday. And then on Monday, I see they're on the news mm -hmm. for armed robbery, for murder. People you grew up with pretty much. People I knew, people I grew up with. And what I started to realize is none of us are a product solely of our own decisions. A lot of our, our, the results of our life are based on the decisions of others. And so there is some rational reality. You look at population, you list, look at statistics, like even you look at the whole police. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. Police are interacting with a lot of black people and they're having a lot of negative interactions. But you have to start to ask the question, how did we get there? No, this, yeah. What were the circumstances surrounding those lives that led them to live out and act out in a way that maybe many of them didn't have any other vision or paradigm or hope for a life uh, to turn out differently? Mm -hmm. And so once I started to get real close to it and started to see, wow, these actions are a result of activities that have been out of their control. No, that's, that's, that's amazing because... Uh, Janelle, did you want to ask something? I know you'd uh, put a couple of questions over there, and then uh, I know you said, "Never mind, hold on." So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, I think uh, when you said decisions don't always determine your destiny, it, it's the antithesis of how I always looked at the world. You know, when it comes yeah. to decisions you determine your destiny, and I think it's probably the way that I look at things to say that I can continue to affect yeah. things on my decisions will determine my destiny, but I think it'll take away the empathy that I should have for other people. That's good. Um, in those situations that I never really thought about that until yeah. you just mentioned That's it. That's good. Cause I would agree with you too. You know, we can all, we, we have to get to a place where we can make decisions that determine our destiny. Yeah. But, but man, so many decisions of others are determining are the destiny, yeah, yeah, of a lot of people. No, that's amazing and, and, and insightful, insightful. Janelle, did you have a question and want to jump on? I know you said, never mind, but I think uh, you, you, you've uh, been talking about uh, these issues with people around, uh, whether it's in your community, at QLI. I know you've even uh, had some time with Pat. What do you want to uh, add on to what Josh is uh, discussing? Um, so my question was a little bit more um, after just Josh reading your five perspectives on the topic of journey to justice um, and talking about leadership and like Nash said, I just have been talking to Pat and other leaders around the company just about this topic and as uncomfortable as it is, obviously it's something that needs to be talked about. So um, under the second one, Vision Matters, um, you said many business organizations have created positions to help them better understand and engage diversity. It highlights the challenges most organizations have due mostly to being led by white leaders. So what are some of your recommendations or positions that can be put within an organization um, that would, or what duties can leaders that we already have in our organization do to increase the diversity and inclusion um, amongst everyone? No, that's a good question. I mean, in, in that article, even the first thing I talked about was just the idea of the purpose of leadership which I just think is so important because the purpose of leadership is to use our influence to impact the world around us. And, and so like the reason we're leaders is because we want to engage in these types of issues and challenges in our world. And we want to be a part of bringing solutions. And so when, when the, the next part, when we talk about kind of the idea of, of vision and taking steps in our organization, number one, like I said, you have to have somebody who sees from the lens of the people you're trying to serve and help. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, you've got to have, Janelle, you've got to have people like you. You've got to have people who have had the black experience and have grown up in an environment where you've seen life differently. I mean, th that voice has to be at the table. And this is one of the things that I see too. That voice doesn't just have to be at the table that voice has to have influence at the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm a part of a lot of circles uh, and, and have, have been a product even where, man, they want diversity at the table, but there's a difference between having diversity at the table and that person of, of and, diversity and having, having influence yeah. at the table yeah. and really being able to speak into issues. Then, I mean, there's a level of investment, a resource base that it's gonna take in order to engage people that are different Again, when I, when I talk to different leaders, they'll say, man, Josh, like our city's just not that diverse. I can't find more black leaders. Or I can't find. Come hey, to my house. Hey, hey, right. <laughs> come to my house. That's because you're hanging out in the wrong circles. Yeah. 
And, and, and part of it with these organizations that I work with, I'm like, man, I've got more friends in your neighborhood than that are a part of your organization. And so I think part of it's the circles that we're surrounding ourselves and also they're leaders that are coming from other states. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be willing to invest, like significantly invest in, in this area uh, when it comes to um, uh, racial equality yeah. and justice. I think too, we have to put black leaders in positions of power. Like I, I never, and, and I don't want to get too political here. So I'm, I'm almost hesitant I think, to I think say we've this. I've had this conversation <laughs> several times that I, I, we have learned. The reason why we're having this, Josh, is to say that uh, we don't, we, we are here to have the discussions that are tough to have yeah. and learn how to have them like adults. And that's why we are at QLI as part of our values. Well, I, I'll, I'll just say this. This is more of an, I don't want to use the word a knock, but a, rep, a, a reflection of how I grew up when Obama was was entering into his first term or before his first term election i was just coming out of college mm. and again i my dad's white man we've been a part of suburban churches in omaha and many organizations and my mom's african-american and like in the circles i grew up in man he he was somebody that couldn't be trusted like he could not be trusted and so i didn't vote for him I voted in the other direction. I, I'll never forget. The reason this stands out so much is I go and vote and then I go work with the, the youth ministry part of what we're doing. I got all these kids seeing, man, they see my, I voted sign. Like, man, who'd you vote for? Yeah, and I, I just remember pay. saying the, sla the saying, like, man, change is coming, change is coming. <laughs> Knowing full well, I didn't vote for him. But then the next term, it, I, I, that was actually when I moved back to the community. Mm -hmm. And I started to see life very differently. And my worldview started to shift and shape. And I didn't realize, I voted for him the second term, but I didn't even realize until later on how huge it was for me to see somebody who looked like me in the highest position of office mm -hmm. in inspiring. our country. Bro. Inspiring. Inspiring. Yeah. Like yeah. I didn't, I didn't even realize what I was missing out on because I never, because it was just what was normal to me. As, as, as a father, I think for me, it was one of those things that I could tell my son and my daughter that, look, you can, you know, aspire to be something right. other than a basketball player that you see on news. Yes. Um, you know, um, and so that's a piece of it when it comes to seeing yeah. someone who can inspire you and hope, you know, and, and that's the same thing, I think, when it comes to teachers yeah. um, in, in our schools. Uh, when you see someone who can relate with you and you can relate to, you yeah. can at least connect those individuals. So I think familiarity is something that's, that's, that's yes. important. I mean, I think, again, to Janelle's point, vision matters. When I see somebody like me in, in a position, I can all of a sudden aspire mm -hmm. to go after things that they've gone after. When I see pictures of me, when I come into an environment and there's pictures and, yeah. and visual renderings where people look like me, wow, I feel like I'm a part of that vision. I when I walk in and I hear music <laughs> that I, that's that similar like. to the music that I like, yeah. wow, yeah. like these people get me, they feel me. And so I think those are some of the practical things that we can do. I, I've, I've heard um, people ask me this question too before, Janelle. They said, you know, what do you think about when you go to a large organization and they have like, um, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a, just like just for blacks only. It's kind of like a club or a group just for blacks only. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I said, you have to think that for most black individuals in our city at a business they're a minority mm -hmm. and when i was at creighton like when i would walk the campus the one or two black people i would see it'd be like hey my brother <laughs> hey what, what's up man how you doing like i felt a chemistry camaraderie i felt like i was home yeah, yeah. it's like when you go home from college and you get your your home cooked meals and you get to experience kind of what's normal yep. for you and so those environments create a camaraderie, kind of a, they, they, they make you feel normal in yeah. the context of being a part of a larger organization. Yeah. So I would actually encourage those groups. But I think if you're really going to be successful as an organization, those groups also have to be connected and woven into the overall culture of the organization. Makes sense. They can't just start to create their own yeah. uh, organization yeah. in and of themselves. Yeah. They should reflect also the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, versus just exclusive to a certain uh, particular group. Now, I see when you're talking about that piece of seeing a person that does look like you, I've got 
uh, uh, some friends who they're they're Nebraska fans, so you know they were in the Big N stuff, yeah. and then they were in Haiti, and uh, they met a guy with an N. With you an N, know, yeah. And, you know, they, you gravitate toward that yep. person. Like, hey, you know, yep. uh, uh, you're, you're you're wearing the same things that I wear. Yes. You know, uh, you see people taking pictures together. I so. run away when I see people wearing the Big N. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a sooner. I'm a sooner. <laughs> you're a sooner. So. Uh, <laughs> so I'm okay with that. If too. I see that big C, that Creighton, then I'll then I'll attract you. <laughs> <laughs> no big end. I, I, I stay away from the big ends as well. Uh, no, 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 no uh, love over there. I guess for people, Bob, Bob, if you're listening, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> now uh, we we do have a lot of. Uh, uh, I, I root for friends. I root for the football team. You you will root for the football. I'll team? root for the football team. Yeah. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit, maybe when it comes to uh, Scott. Uh, who does go to Love Church? Heard you speak on uh, on on the topic of Black Lives Matter. Mm. You know uh, when you were when you were there, and um, he said you had a great analogy. You mm. know uh, that you shared when it came to helping people understand why, when people say Black Lives Matter, what it means and how to maybe uh, embrace it versus you know all lives matter. You know in that right. situation. So because um, we do know all lives matter. You yes. know. Uh, so uh, t- can you can you help? Uh, uh, understand yeah. and maybe share the same analogy and i don't remember the analogy that i shared about a fireman no. but uh yeah like if uh and it's actually an analogy i heard from somebody else and they said you know if you're in a neighborhood and a house is on fire you're gonna rush to that house you're gonna you're gonna try to do everything you can to put that fire out and and the neighbors aren't gonna be right next door saying well our house matters too our it's like no you're gonna focus on the house that's on fire yeah and i heard another analogy uh recently which i really liked and and they use the COVID-19 analogy. Tell me more. They said, you know, this, this COVID-19 outbreak has been obviously a pandemic. And all the medical professionals are doing everything they can to solve this, this, this COVID crisis. Yeah. It's not that uh, cancer doesn't matter. It's not that these other illnesses, diseases yeah. don't matter. But we're not talking about those right, right now, now because the thing that is most important and the thing that's front and center is the COVID-19 crisis. And so I think the same is true with this race conversation. I think so many people get caught up in the Black Lives Matter organization versus the movement of Black Lives Matter, which Mm -hmm. is the idea that because of the challenges that Black lives have faced for generations, Black Lives Matter. And, And I've just been encouraging people, we have to be able to say that. And and these videos that have come out, in my mind, have given visuals to voices that have been crying out for generations. Mm -hmm. And I think about the circles that I'm in and and trying to to share what it means to be Black in America, what it means to be a minority and not have the same opportunities. And for years, it's like, oh, man, that's like, stop complaining. Man, that's just you. And, and, mm-hmm. and when you see Ahmaud Arbery, when you see George Floyd, you realize it's not just one, it's not just two. It's pretty much every person who is a minority, who's black, has had these experiences that uh, are real and valid. And to, to say all lives matter totally invalidates mm-hmm. what they're feeling yeah. and what they're going through. And so, again, I think like, if your child is hurting, I heard another analogy with that, which I love, or your child sitting on your lap and they say, daddy, do you love me? And I say, well, I love all my kids. I mean, it totally doesn't speak to what to they're, child, what yeah, they to want, that child and to what they're, what, what they're asking for. And so I think obviously all of us, number one, what's our motivation? Mm-hmm. Is our motivation to be right? Or is our motivation to express unconditional love to people who are crying out and saying, man, I'm hurting. I've been a victim. I've been abused. I've been traumatized. I haven't had the same opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so I think motive, motive matters. But, but I think we can, we can validate phrases like that without saying, I'm, I'm for this whole organization and I'm yeah. for everything that, yeah. that it stands for. Yeah. But I can yeah. say, man, Nash, you matter. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And, and that's yeah. what that's what we're saying when we say Black Lives Matter. We're just we're we're, we're saying I acknowledge that mm-hmm. Black lives haven't mattered as much as other lives. Mm-hmm. And so in this moment, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say something. Yeah. And it it means a lot when people do. That's, that is powerful. Um, 
from from Bit Bridge Church, you know, um, with the crisis that we're seeing right now, um, what has your role been? What have you been busy doing when it comes to trying to make sense of? Someone once said something like, "If you're uh, not confused about what's going on right now, you, you're confused." You know? <laughs> so, how are you helping make sense of, of, of what's going on? With your role, uh, not only from abide, but from from as a pastor. Yeah, I mean, I think you. you at, with any situation as a leader, you take it one day at a time, you take it one step at a time. Um, you know, I think as for me, as a person of faith, our, our faith requires us to live a certain way. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the life of Jesus, who is who we follow, and I see over and over stories of where he went to places and went to people that everybody else walked around and went mm -hmm. away from. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when he found people who are considered the outcasts, people who weren't considered to be as worthy as others. He went to them specifically and did everything he could so they could have the same opportunities as everybody else. Yeah. And so for me, like the, the, the message and what I constantly go back to, many of us are familiar with the golden rule. The golden rule is do for others what you want them to do for you. I think in, in Christianity and in Jesus, I see what I call the game changer rule where he goes and does for others regardless yeah. of what they could do for him. Yeah. And I think we live in a culture, especially when we talk to business leaders and investors, it's like, man, what can, what type of return can I get on my investment? Mm. What can I get back in, in this relationship? And, and for many of us, I think our faith should and can require us to not worry about what we're going to get, but just worry about how can we serve? How can we give? And so uh, like when COVID hit, we, we pivoted some of our strategies organizationally and said, how can we just meet some practical needs? So we started doing food distribution. Nice. And so over the last 13 or so weeks, every Monday night, we're distributing food. I think we've done 65,000 meals. That's amazing. Where are you getting your, your, your resources for? We got some that? donations. We've got a partnership with uh, the Omaha Food Bank. Great. We've got people who, who come in and, and partner to bring a hot meal, whether it's pizza, tacos, they serve um, while, while they're there. They'll help purchase that hot meal and then help serve it. Wow. Uh, hot dogs, hamburgers. Like I said, we, we kill We're always looking for partners. Come on, man! Every every, every yeah. Monday night, right now, we did a drive-through block party where we partnered with a, a group called Convoy of Hope. Mm -hmm. They're an international relief organization. They brought a semi-load full of groceries. We had 800 boxes of groceries that we handed out. That's um, so, but just trying to say, how can we serve? How can we give? How can we do for others regardless of what we get? And I think this race conversation is the same thing. You know, I think specifically, if you are white and you're part of the dominant culture, mm -hmm. it's so easy to say, man, I didn't cause that. I didn't do it. Yeah. And I, I love all people. And, and while I think there's a lot of validity and truth to that, for me, our faith causes me to say, you know what? Even though I didn't cause it and start it, I can be a part of changing it. No, because that's what I, I see in Jesus's life. So I love that game changer. Yeah, no, that's, that, that is amazing. And uh, thank you for everything that you've been doing. I know you've been bringing uh, healing to a fractured community in the city. And um, I think you've been to so many places. I heard more about what you've been saying in the community um, from other people. <laughs> and it's like, oh, Josh Dosma said this. And uh, so you, you're doing a, an amazing job of being out there and uh, definitely committing mm. to the mission that you're you, you're here for so Appreciate thank you for, for that and yeah uh, and thank you for coming to QLI one of the things um from a values perspective you talked about better together uh, yeah. you talked about game changer is yeah. that another value of yep. you guys yeah um I think those are all important so from a QLI perspective I think as I'm hearing you speak uh, you know one of the one of the values we have is optimism you know and having Love this that. idea of creating a positive culture through optimism and thinking yep. you know instead of just being a pessimist uh not only for the residents that we're serving who have their lives you know been shattered you yep. know but for, for for their families but also for our team members in our community mm -hmm. you know so from an optimistic perspective what hope do you have for the future josh man well i love the word i love the fact that you said hope because when i think of optimism i think of hope and uh i think hope allows us to keep going and moving forward and i have tons of hope the fact that we're having this conversation right now, you know, I, I, I believe that catalyst can be a crisis or crisis can be a catalyst for change mm. if we allow the crisis to change us. 
And so we're in a moment of crisis right now with, with the racial tension that's going on. And the more we lean into these conversations, the more we make a commitment to learning and understanding and, and standing with people who are fighting on the front lines, I think we can all be so much farther along. We can be so much better as we continue to navigate this crisis. And as a result, we can see more change on the other side of it. Wow. I love it. It, it gives me a little bit of hope you know, when, you, when you're seeing things. Uh, I try to ch- tune out of the news a lot. And <laughs> it it, it, it just shutters you, you know, when it comes know. to, oh my gosh, c- can we not look at that again? Right. You know, can we not see that again? You yeah. know, uh, but it's just so much in our faces. And it's- well, I'll, I'll just say this. I think specifically when Ahmaud Arbery happened, mm-hmm. so many black leaders I talked to said, man, this is just another one. Like they felt super hopeless. The response specifically of the white community yeah. from George Floyd yeah. filled people with hope. Yeah. And so it matters that we say something, that we stand up, that we have these conversations and that we continue to grow through all of this. Yeah, no, I know I, I uh, uh, sent you, I don't know if you had even had time to listen to it, but uh, the last huddle that we had with Rudy, yeah. Um, and that's the same thing that he had. He said, you know, because he was there in the 60s, yeah. you know, um, uh, marching and, and sitting, actually, and uh, refusing to leave the lunch counters. Mm. Uh, and, and he said, you know, we, we, we sat there and there were some white people who were supportive. But yeah. uh, the difference between then and now is I look there and there's more white people than anyone yeah. else, you know. And so that is something that is a hopeful aspect of it. Janelle, so, you want to jump in and ask a question? I know you, uh, you said you want to jump in real quick. Um, Yes, I have a a question for you, Josh, definitely a a faith-based question. Um, So as a Christian woman, my heart has been absolutely broken um, with everything that has happened in our nation, especially what's happening today, um, whether it's from when I turn on the news or look at social media, um, some of the comments, whether they be insensitive or just downright hateful. Um, what would be your advice for me moving forward to continue to fight against these injustices and speak out, but do it without the anger and the hurt that I'm feeling right now um, with even people that I currently work with or people in my personal life? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. And I, I don't want to act like it's, it's like just an answer because <laughs> I think there's a process. And I love what you said. I mean, for all of us, I think hurt people hurt people. And so we have to make sure that, that we are healthy and whole and we can only give what's on the inside of us. And so I think there's just this process. I think, number one, it's important to recognize that anytime significant crisis or trauma happens, there's a process to restoration and recovery. And part of it is feeling the emotions. I mean, there's, there's a word, uh, this idea of lamenting. It's, it's actually this idea of like being sorrowful and grief and crying out. And I think for so many in this season, it's okay to be there. We don't have to be at the restoration phase right away, but recognizing there's a process and I can take time to grieve and, and I can process it. And then as a person of faith, I've got to build my foundation on what's, on what's most important, on, on, on my faith, on what the word of, of God says. And I think like Nash said, If you watch TV a lot, man, you're going to be filled up with a lot of negative emotions and feelings. And, and so I think what we're in taking, what we're taking in matters. And so making sure that you're, you're taking in healthy perspective and, and, and I think too, whether it's reading, uh, there's so many podcasts and books that are out there that you can listen to. I get so encouraged when I listen to different people share and communicate. So I think just recognizing, okay, I got I got to take all this in and then recognizing change doesn't happen in a day. It happens every day. And so every day, I've just got to get a little better. I've just got to keep growing, keep developing, make sure I guard my heart. I can't change everybody. I can't change everything. But man, maybe I can encourage somebody. Maybe I can bring light to somebody. And and just taking those small steps, I think, really uh, ultimately leads to big wins. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. One more thing. Community matters. And so being with people who encourage you right where you are, we can't do this we can't do life by ourselves. And Mm -hmm. so I think COVID has, has really created a lot of isolation for a lot of us and a lot of people. And so you have to make sure that you are plugged in to a community of people that believe what you believe that are going to continue to encourage you and inspire you because we all have off days, bad days, 
we mm -hmm. all need hope. And a lot of times that comes through other people. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Pat asked uh, a question, maybe uh, for our team members, you know, uh, but maybe I'll pose it to you. She said, looking ahead at the next six months to a year, what specific do you hope to see, a uh, change you hope to see in our, in our community? And what do you feel that, that QLI uh, as an organization uh, can do to play a bigger role in that change? You want me to start? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's for you. Nah. <laughs> Everybody else is going to answer that. I question. mean, I, I hope, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, I already feel this, but I hope that we don't miss the moment. And it's, well, life is so busy and there's so many priorities and so many things. And, and, and I already, I mean, when Ahmad Arbery ha happened, I already started to feel us moving on to the next thing. And I think if we're not careful, we'll start moving on to the next thing and not really allow this moment to change us mm -hmm. and to shift our perspective and to keep having these conversations. So I hope that we'll keep the conversation going. I hope that we'll keep the sense of urgency that we felt when our city, <laughs> when, when protests and, I mean, violence was happening. I said, I, I hate seeing all that. Yeah. I've never had so many white leaders reach out to me. And, and have a desire to learn and grow. So I hope we don't miss out and, and, and I hope we keep that sense of urgency because I think ultimately that will lead us to take some more significant action, which I think is, is what we need to do. I think QLI, you know, I probably don't know enough about all that QLI is doing. I think you got to keep- your, This is your moment to this say is my moment, you're man. do. <laughs> I mean, based on everything I know, QLI moment. is like the greatest organization I've ever been a part of. So I think you got to keep doing what you're doing. I think you got to keep empowering guys like you. I think you got to keep empowering Janelle. You got to keep putting people in position. I think too, you guys are like a hidden gem. And I would love for more people to be exposed to you and to, to see what you're doing, to see the visuals. I don't know what all that can look like, but I just, when you, when you asked that question, that was one of the first things that I thought people need to know about you guys because you're doing a great job. And, and, and then I think some of the things we talked about earlier, even being more intentional by getting voices in to say, you know what, we've got to have influencers around the table that are black, that are minorities that can speak into what we're doing because this thing is dynamic. It's not static. It's always evolving but we've got to be as a team, always be ready and willing to make those intentional steps to engage more diversity.